Okay, so let's. We'll kind of kind of review about what we've been talking about. So what we have now is a 1D reservoir. It could be at an angle. Could be at a dip angle like I had before, but um, but I'll draw it as if it's not. Let's just say it's horizontal. And what you have is you've got SOI and SWI. And of course, SOI is 1 minus SWI. So SWI is the initial water saturation. That'll probably be relatively small. I'm going to say it's 20%. And for our purposes right now, it's going to equal to the residual or irreducible water saturation. What that means is that that water that's there initially does not move. It's immobile. It's trapped by capillary forces, interfacial tension. Okay, the oil does move. So maybe this is 20% and maybe this is 80%. And let's say it's uniform everywhere. The front, the middle, the back. And then I'm going to inject, we'll call this an injector. It's like an injector well. So I inject Q, which is so many barrels of water. All right, could be 100 barrels per day, or if this is in a lab, it could be so many milliliters per minute but you inject water at a certain rate. And then because we're assuming that all these fluids are in incompressible for practical purposes, you have the same amount of fluid that comes out as before. So initially, can you all tell me what comes out first? In theory, it's all oil if the initial water is residual water saturation. Um, because that water that is present is immobile. So initially, everything that comes out is oil. Now, I'll, I'll say that you're technically right, Scott, because um, that's just in theory, in every reservoir, you'll probably get a little bit of water. But for our purposes, everything that comes out initially is oil, because any water that's here at the, at the back is just immobile residual water. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, good, good. So, so initially, only oil's coming out. And that's great. That's great. We're injecting inexpensive water and we're producing oil that's going to make us money. Okay, that's fantastic. We would love for this to continue on through the whole core. We would love for this water to be injected and to move like a piston and for that water just to push the oil out. Okay, you can imagine what if this wasn't a porous medium but just a tube? and it was filled with oil, and you just pushed water, and the water pushed out all the oil, and then the oil came out. That would be fantastic. Unfortunately, that's not what happens. As this water front starts to move from left to right, the water starts to bypass the oil, and the water reaches the producer well before all the recoverable oil is produced. Okay, and we call that the breakthrough time. So the breakthrough time is equal to the time when water injected reaches the producer. Okay. When that happens, when that happens, I start producing both water and oil. And the water actually goes up quite quickly. So, and as time goes on, you'll produce more and more water and less and less oil. And at some point, you're injecting water and you're producing mostly water and it's just not even, it's not even uh, economical at, at that point. Uh, so we want to understand that. We want to understand when this breakthrough time happens. We want to understand what the water cut or fractional flow is at the producer well. We want to know what the water saturation is as a function of space and time. By the way, this breakthrough time in dimensionless form is going to be less than one. Okay, it's one poor volume. If, if, if the breakthrough time was equal to one, that would be perfect. That would be our scenario where we had a perfect piston-like displacement. That would mean that we would put in effectively one poor volume of water, it would produce the oil and we'd be good, but that's not what happens. TD is always less than one and sometimes significantly less than one. And uh, this is going to depend on things like the relative permeability curves. 
But uh, we'll also want to know what the water saturation is as a function of space and time. So at a given time, dimensionless time, if we were to plot 0 to xd of 1, and we had saturation, you'll probably get something that looks like this. Okay. The water saturation is high at the inlet because we're injecting water. It's not going to be 100% though. It'll be 1 minus the residual oil saturation because you'll have that trapped oil there. The water saturation will decrease. And usually, except for very strange relative permeability curves, you're going to get this sudden drop off, which we call a shock front. And then after that, the water saturation is just the immobile water saturation. So that, so what, what that means is until this shock front reaches the producer here at x is equal to 1, you're going to produce all oil. Once that shock front reaches there, then all of a sudden you produce water, and actually a lot of it. And uh, this is at a particular time TD, and you could visualize this as being a time-dependent moving front. So what you, you'll get is at a later time, you'll get something that looks like this, and eventually you'll get there, and this is the breakthrough time. Okay. So this is the saturation versus distance at a given time. What we also might want to plot is saturation, or more likely the water fractional flow at the producer with time. So this is saturation versus distance, but at a particular distance, as d xd is equal to 1, we would want to plot the fractional flow. So any questions about that? So I'm going to, if, if you think of any, then just speak up. Um, but uh, I'm going to review some of the handwritten notes I did last time. What we were been, have been deriving is a partial differential equation that describes it's a mass balance for water. We had one for oil, too. We're only using the one for water. Uh, we had this equation over here where SW is the water saturation, UW is the velocity. But then when we remembered that because the velocity is constant, it's not a function of x, because fluids are incompressible, that I could write u as being fw, I could write uw as being fw times u. And u is constant, so I could pull it out. So this was the PDE I had. Then what I did is I introduced dimensionless properties. So I had a dimensionless length. So the length of the reservoir could be 1,000 feet, it could be 5,000 feet, it could be 50,000 feet. But we're going to normalize it by the length. So xd is x over l. So if x is 0, then xd is 0. If xd is at the edge at the producer well, then xd is 1, because l over l is 1. td is the dimensionless time. It's the, poor, it's the volume injected divided by the pore volume. Pore volume is, of course, the bulk volume times the porosity, or AL phi. The volume injected is the injection rate, Q, times the total time, T. Now, TD is at a minimum zero, um, but it can go to greater than one. We can, we can inject for infinity if we wanted to. Uh, but remember, and we'll show this later, is that the breakthrough time is always less than one. If we introduce those dimensionless variables, we get a dimensionless mass balance equation, which is dsw dtd plus dfw dxd. So now I've removed all of my dimensional parameters, things like porosity and velocity and stuff like that. And we do have some boundary and initial conditions. So obviously the initial water saturation is SWI. That may be the residual water saturation. And uh, the boundary conditions are we inject 100% water. Okay, um, you, you could technically inject other things, but it um, doesn't make a lot of economical sense to in inject oil and water to try to produce oil. So we inject uh, water, so the fractional flow of water is 100%. And if the fractional flow of water is 100%, then the saturation of water is 1 minus SOR right there at the, at the very front of the core, so like just right inside the core, right inside the reservoir. Uh, 
And so this is, again, sort of my picture that I, that I always draw. So, so we've got this equation here, and then we did one more thing. We did one more thing. So we took this fractional flow, and we recognized that fractional flow is a function of saturation. So if I impose the chain rule, remember the chain rule says that dfw dx d is equal to dfw dsw times dsw dx d. So now I get an equation that looks like this. Sometimes I'll write this as fw prime, just kind of shorthand. And now I've got a PDE that's got SW that I'm solving for as a function of time and space. And we call this the buckley levered equation. Remember that fractional flow, FW, is a function of water saturation. And it looks like this. It was on your exam. So at SW is equal to SW R, fractional flow is zero, and at SW is equal to one minus SOR, fractional flow is one, it's 100%, right? Because once you, get to, once you get to residual oil saturation, that oil is not moving, so, there's, so UO is zero, that means UW is equal to U, so UW over U is one or 100%. We don't want fractional flow here, we want the derivative of fractional flow. We want DFW, DSW. And um, maybe we can, maybe we can uh, analytically do it, but that's a little tricky. Okay, it's probably a lot of math. What you did on your homework, or at least what I suggested you do, is to do it numerically. You actually just kind of took a, approximated the slope of the line tangent to the curve at all different places. And clearly, the slope of the this curve is zero here, and it's zero here, but it's much larger in between. And if you were to plot that. DFW DSW or FW prime versus water saturation, you'll get something that looks like this. And so we're going to evaluate this DFW DSW at a specific water saturation. So let's say water saturation was 0.4, you come up over here and it looks like DFW DSW is about 1, right? Um, or if you're here, you come over here, it looks like it's 0.5 is close to 2. So, um, and we'll learn how to do that more. You, you um, will be using that in, especially next week. Okay, so it still doesn't tell me a lot about how I want to solve this problem. How do I want to solve for SW as a function of TD and XD? This is a partial differential equation. You all took ordinary differential equations or differential equations. Um, as a course, you learn different techniques. You probably didn't solve this partial differential equation. Maybe you did something like it, but, but probably not, or if you did, maybe you forgot how to do it. Uh, but before we solve that, we, we need to discuss one other thing which will help us to solve it, and that's to talk about the saturation front, or the velocities. And so what I have plotted here is water saturation versus dimensionless distance at different times. Kind of like I did right here. Saturation versus distance at different times. Now, I, um, what I did there, first off, this plot looks a little bit different than the one I, I drew. There's no shock fronts. And, and I did that intentionally because uh, I'm going to introduce shock fronts sometime next week. Um, but I, I'd like to make an important note, which is listed on there, is that this saturation of profile would only occur for non-physical relative permeability curves. Actual saturation profile to come soon, that's the shock front. So uh, keep in mind that, that a real saturation profile is going to look more like what I drew on the piece of paper. But the key point is here is that saturation of the water with distance varies with time, and it's it's like a it's like a moving it's like a moving front. Okay, you can almost think of it like as a as a wall that's moving from the injector to the producer. Except that it's not just one straight wall; it varies. So maybe the water saturation is high near the injector. Of course, that makes sense. You're injecting water; it's going to be high there. Then it decreases. And then somewhere downstream, 
you're going to have your initial or residual water saturation. And if we choose a specific water saturation, any one, we'll call it SW, in this case I chose SW is equal to 0.5. Then at SW, SW is equal to 0.5 at it looks like a distance of 0.18 or something. Here, do you see that? This is at TD1. But at a later time, the water saturation is equal to 0.5 at about 0.3. At an even later time, it looks like it's at about 0.45, right? So this water saturation, these blue dots, are moving with time. So if I had my reservoir, my rock core, then there's some position where the water saturation is equal to, for example, 0.5. And that position where that saturation is equal to 0.5 moves with time. And we're going to call that the velocity of the saturation front, Vw, which is the derivative of distance with time. I mean, we know that that's what, what velocity is, right? Velocity is a change in position over time. And so what Vw is, is the change in xd, XD is changing here, right? It's, it's this, then it's this, then it's this, then it's this, divided by DTD, where the DTD is like DD, TT, TD2 minus TD1 or something, right? So it's the change in, in X divided by the change in time. And we're going to call this VW, and it's specific to the saturation, 0.5. If I had chosen 0.4, VW would be different. 0.6 would be different. So this is VW, that's the, the saturation front. Only this curve is the breakthrough time because you got a TD1, you got a TD2, and then you have a TD3 here. And prior to TD3, that water that you're injecting hasn't reached the producer yet. And it's only at TD3. TD3 is the first time where any water you injected has made its way to the producer well. I see, because so that, so that's why we, Yeah, so that's why we call it the breakthrough time. So early, you know, and that makes sense, right? If you have a reservoir that's really long, a thousand feet long, and you start injecting water in the injector, it's not gonna reach the producer right away. It's gonna take some time to get there. And uh, the time that it takes to get there is the breakthrough time. We call it the breakthrough time because it's the time that it breaks through to the producer well. Got it? Thank you. Yep. Okay, so um, let me just go back and show this one, one real quick. We're looking at these velocities at a very specific saturation, SW. So SW is not changing. It is 0.5, it's 0.5, it's 0.5, it's 0.5. It's those blue dots. So saturation is not changing. Or in other words, the change in saturation DSW is going to be zero. Now remember, SW is a function of XD and TD. And you have to remember a little bit of your calculus class here. And I, I'm almost positive this is something you would have learned in your thermo class. So who did you guys take for thermo? Was it Dr. DiCarlo? Yeah. So he, I bet he did a lot with partials, right? Because things like things can be a function of both pressure and time. So if this is a function of both space and time, then DSW is really the partial derivative of SW with respect to XD, DXD, plus the partial of FW, of, I'm sorry, SW, sorry for the typo, SW with respect to TD times TD. Does that look familiar? Okay, when, when Dr. DiCarlo was talking about entropy and maybe it was a function of, um, it's been a while since I've taken thermo, but if it's a function of pressure and temperature, then he may have done something like this as well, right? So 
Um, this is a function of more than one variable. And this sort of makes sense, right? You kind of think of this as being canceling each other. So you get a, a partial, you get a change in saturation due to distance and you get a change in saturation due to time because saturation is a function of both space and time. So this is like the total change and these are the individual changes due to space and time. And because, because I was looking at those blue dots and those blue dots had the same saturation, that means that DSW is equal to zero. Make sense? If SW is constant, then the change in SW is zero. And now what I can do is I can rearrange this a little bit. So rearrange. And I'll say that partial of SW with respect to TD, that's this guy right here, plus DXD DTD times partial of XW with respect to XD is equal to zero. What did I do there? Um, all I did was divide through by DTD. Oh, this was a, a DTD right there, right? So that cancels. So now I'm, I'm left with this equation. Everybody see how I got that? Don't speak up. Okay. Now, point out a few things. This was my VW on that PowerPoint slide, the velocity of saturation front. But also, from our water material balance, our mass balance, we know that partial of SW with respect to TD plus FW prime SW of XD is equal to zero, right? This was our mass balance we derived. That was the buckley levered equation. This is just a, a, essentially a, a, a definition from what would, it, what would it take to make the change in saturation zero. And if I compare these two equations, they look very similar. They at least look similar, and I see this term must be equal to that term, and then they would be identical. So that means that the velocity of the water saturation front of constant saturation is equal to dxd dtd by definition, but that must equal to fw prime or if I wanted to write it DFW, DSW. You follow that? Or dxd is equal to fw prime dtd. Would you mind getting, thank you. Okay. And when we have differentials, we like to integrate those. dxd is equal to fw prime integral dtd. And we'll want to go from zero to some distance xd and zero to some time td. And these are extremely easy integrals, right? So 
the integral of dx. The integral of 1 dx is just, it's just x. So what we get is we get x d is equal to f prime t d. This looks like a, a pretty easy equation. It says the distance x d is equal to the fractional flow, derivative of the fractional flow of water times T D. Where the fr fr derivative of fractional flow of water is of course a function of water saturation. Right? So what we wanted, what we wanted is a plot or an equation for water saturation as a function of distance at a given time. This isn't quite that, but it's really close. This is not water saturation as a function of distance. Instead, it's distance as a function of water saturation. And it is a function of water saturation because Fw prime is a function of water saturation. So it's not really an explicit equation. It's more of an implicit equation. Well, there are a lot of you with your videos off, so if you wouldn't mind, we turn them on. I like seeing your faces and making this interactive. So we only do it once a week. Um, so uh, this is this is the equation we have. So how do we use it? Okay. How do we how do we make our saturation versus um, distance curve. Well, we um, we've got uh, for a given saturation, we can calculate the fractional. Well, for a given saturation, we can calculate the relative permeability. Right, we got relative permeability curves. From the relative permeability curves, you can calculate the fractional flow. Right, we had an equation for that. From the fractional flow, we can calculate the derivative of the fractional flow. So. Um, so that's how we calculate that. So let me let me ex explain. I'll call it an algorithm for how to do that. And this would make for a great Python assignment. Although I'm, I might be nice to not make you do it in Python, but um, it would be. So let's see. We want. SW versus XD at different times. Okay, so we'll choose a TD. So I'm going to say choose a TD that you want to make the plot. Then you choose an SW, and, and you'll want to choose um, SWR is less than SW is less than 1 minus SOR, right? We don't want less than the residual water saturation or greater than the residual oil saturation, or, or less than the residual oil saturation for oil. So you choose an SW in that, in that range. And then now that you've got a, an, an SW, you calculate FW prime at SW. Remember, we, we have that equation or those curves. And what you'll probably be asked to do on a homework or an exam is I might give you those curves. I might just give you a plot and ask you to read off the plot with a pencil and a paper. So do, uh, do expect to maybe do that. We'll probably do some examples in class to do that. Um, so, uh, so we calculate that. Then the next thing we do is now that we got FW prime, we got TD, you, you calculate XD is equal to FW prime times TD. So basically what I'm doing here Remember, this is SWXD. For a given time, TD, 
you choose an SW, okay, Let's say it's 0.5 or something, and then calculate FW prime, and then you multiply by TD and you get XD. So you come over here and you plot your point. And then you repeat for different saturations. And so you, you might have, um, you might be plotting all these points, and you might get something like that, right? Which is very similar to the thing I showed a few minutes ago. This is just for one time, TD1, and then I could say repeat. for different TDs, right? different times. So if I were writing a code to do this in Python or something, what I would probably do is have an outer loop where I loop through time from zero to, I don't know, two poor volumes or something. And then an inner, inner loop where I loop through saturation and I started at SWR and I ended at one minus SOR. And in that inner loop, I, I calculated FW prime and, and these other things, right? So uh, that's how you do that. Any questions? No questions, huh? Okay. Um, okay, so now we got that. Let me move on to the to the next part, which is compute the breakthrough time. I'll call that TD breakthrough. Now remember that the breakthrough time is always going to be less than or equal to 1. Really, it's going to be less than 1. It can never be greater than 1. Okay, so if you calculate it as greater than 1, you made a mistake. If xd is equal to fw td, Then, what is XD equal to at the production well? Mr. Uh, Mr. Crow, Samuel Crow. What's XD at the production well? Um, I, I, I don't know. Okay, so X is, is the distance and, and XD goes from zero to one. So XD is zero of the injector and it's one of the producer. So at the producer well, XD is one. Okay. And if we want to find the breakthrough time, so that means I can write TD is equal to one over FW prime. If I if I'm call this the breakthrough time, then this is at the saturation of this front right here. So this is a, a very easy way I shouldn't say very easy, but it is a fairly easy way to calculate the breakthrough time, the time at which the water takes that you inject to reach the producer well. It's 1, because xd is equal to 1 of the producer, divided by the derivative of fractional flow, 
obviously that's a function of saturation, so we need to know what saturation, and it's the saturation of this moving front here, SWF. We'll talk more about how to find SWF next week. Okay, now, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to finish this, so we'll finish on Monday if I don't. Calculating cumulative oil recovery. NPD. I mean, that's what we really care about as reservoir engineers, right? You wanna tell your boss how much oil you are you gonna produce in how much time? Right? That's what you that's what you want to tell your boss. And so NPD is a dimensionless number. Dimensionless. The oil produced barrels divided by the pour volume barrels. So if you want to know what oil produces in barrels, then you're just going to multiply NPD times pour volume. Now the amount of oil produced is the initial amount of oil that's there minus the final amount, right? The initial amount is the original oil in place, OOIP, minus the final amount, which is the final OIP. Everybody agree with that? Divided by the pour volume, of course. And the initial oil in place is 1 minus the initial water in place times the pour volume. Everybody see that? So I've got some water present. Everything that's not water is oil. We're just talking about two-phase flow. So 1 minus SWI is SO. SO times VP is the original oil in place. Minus the final oil in place is gonna be one minus SW average times VP. Now what do I mean by that? SW bar is the average water saturation. That, that can and it will be different at different locations in the reservoir, but it's the average water saturation. So this is the average water saturation at the end. One minus the average water saturation is the average oil saturation so the average oil saturation times the pour volume is the amount of oil in barrels that's in the reservoir. And I'm going to divide by a VP. Of course, these cancel. And so then I'm left with, oh, if you rewrite this, you actually, the ones cancel and you get SW bar minus SWI. This is NPD. Okay, so the dimensionless oil you recover is the average water saturation at the end of your water flood, or your, you know, whatever time you're concerned with, minus the initial water saturation. Now, the initial water saturation we probably have. Maybe, maybe we used some well logs to figure that out. Maybe we used, uh, maybe we took a core sample and we measured it. But SW bar is a little bit more challenging, and so I'll have to to tell you how to do that as well. So also, NPD is again the oil produced divided by the pour volume. So the oil produced is the integral of the oil rate times time. And this is the oil rate at a specific location, which is XD is equal to one, DT from zero to T divided by the pore volume. Everybody agree with that? I mean, we're, we're producing oil at some rate. That can change. Maybe it's constant early on, but then maybe it, it declines. And so it's gonna be a function of time. But if you integrate, if you get the area underneath the rate versus time curve, then that's the cumulative oil produced. So that goes from zero to T divide by the pore volume.
QO is equal to Q times the fractional flow of oil. So I can write this as Q over AL phi because pore volume is AL phi times the integral from zero to T of FO at the producer well times DT. And since T, since uh, TD is equal to Q over AL phi, that means DTD is equal to Q over AL phi DT. So I can get rid of that and make this all dimensionless. And NPD is the integral from zero to my dimensionless time. of FO at the producer well, where XD is equal to one, DTD. And I'm gonna have to integrate that. It's a little tricky, I gotta use integration by parts. So a little trick that you learned in your calculus class. But once I integrate that, I'm going to compare it to this. I'm going to set them equal to each other, and then I can um, solve for things like the average water saturation and, and, and figure um, out what that is as a function of time. Okay.